All right. Hope everyone had a decent lunch. Uh, that's why I'm late. I was a little bit, uh, forgot the time I was eating. <laughs> so um, we're back. Uh, Fazl Saeed Al Mutar is our next speaker. And uh, uh, Fazl originally is from Iraq. He's a, um, now a resident alien, is that it? So what? You're a resident alien now of the United States? Yeah, no, yeah. I'm not the alien. Okay. Uh, I'm human. Yeah, okay, well. <laughs> Well, we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> and uh, I first met uh, Fossil at Skepticon a couple of years ago. And um, uh, outside the door, he was wearing a NASA t-shirt. I said, hey, that's somebody that I can relate to. And we struck up a conversation and, uh, you know, kind of uh, been talking and hanging out ever since. And uh, uh, Fossil is the... Um, uh, founder of the secular secular humanist movement, and also the community manager at movements.org. And with uh, oh, one other thing, he used to be um, a correspondent for Christopher Hitchens. Is that right? Pretty close. So he used to work for Hitch. So let's give it up for Fazel. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It seems like there's no podium. I should stand. I'm, I'm just uncomfortable with just standing. Uh, how is everyone doing? Yeah, so it's spread, pretty straightforward, isn't it? So I don't really need to give a speech at all. Um, well, thank you, Thomas, for introducing me. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, this is probably my fourth speech in Missouri, which is kind of interesting. Like, of all places, I, I come gave more speeches as at Missouri. Who would have thought? Uh, and um, so, <laughs> this is actually not my not my gram. Uh, it's Institute of Internet Diagrams made this wonderful, uh, very simple, straightforward um, <laughs> diagram, and it, 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 that's what I love about it. It says because it's pretty simple. They say like Palestine and Israel were discounted for the sake of simplicity, <laughs> because I mean. Who would have thought? Like it's so 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 hard to digest. Um, so this is where I'm from, that this region. Even though if you take some countries, sometimes there's a big mistake. Is like the some countries are considered the Middle East, even though they're not really in the Middle East geographically, and they're mixed up together. And uh, but that's pretty much like Pakistan, for example, the Southeast Asia. But one of the main reasons why Pakistan is being put inside the diagram is because of the influence made by Saudi Arabia, which is a country in the Middle East that is where Islam was born. And they had their influences and they built their madrasas around in Southeast Asia to the way that the, sometimes the, the Middle East goes beyond the Middle East. Um, in in uh, my speech in Vancouver, uh, I was asked, like, why should, I, why should I care about the Middle East? And I said, if you're not interested in the Middle East, then the Middle East is interested in you. And um, there are the events of, of 9-11 and 7-7 in London and so many other, in Boston bombing, um, and so many others shows that, the, that the, what's happening now in the Middle East can really have effects not just beyond Iraq and Syria where I come from, but rather can have effect on the West where I think most of you live, except I'm seeing aliens over here. Um, so the, the topic of my speech today is how with all the excuse my, the term, but all of this clusterfuck. Um, how can, what, what can we do to, to help secular activists, liberal activists who are living in the Middle East right now, who are trying to move things forward? But let me just explain a bit of the simple diagram, even though I don't think it needs explanation. Um, so you got, you got the three major powers in this diagram, which is Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, I would say Saudi Arabia and Iran and Israel. Israel was taken for the simplicity part. So you got Saudi Arabia, which is kind of the main hub for Sunni Islam in the Middle East, which is suppresses ideology of Wahhabism through lots of money of oil. And, and you have Iran, which is the, the contrary, that they are a Shia Islamic regime. They also want to spread their, uh, their ideology. You're having a lot of funding. So you can see the diagram where it explains is that Iran funds militias across the region, like al-Houthis in Yemen, which Saudi Arabia is fighting. 
you have they're funding Hezbollah in Lebanon, and, uh, and they're also funding the Shia Iraqi government, which is fighting ISIS. So, and then you get the Saudi Arabia, who are funding, who I would say build the foundation or the theological foundation for ISIS and Al Qaeda, and also the Muslim Brotherhood. They used to be allies, but now they're not. So you can see friend, foe, and uncertain. So uncertain is, is sometimes you never know what they really believe. But you have Qatar supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. So you have all of this, as I mentioned, is uh, all of this complicated wars that are going on in the Middle East that are generally ignored. Because whenever somebody talks about war, it's either between the United States and Iraq or either between Israel and Palestine. But what's hardly ignored is actually the internal conflicts that are going on across the region. So what, with all of this, what can we do? And this is something that I've been investing most of my time in for the past, I would say, more than a year, is we, we, we don't know. So everybody says, like, who are our allies in the region? You see, like, all of these folks here change their mind frequently. And I would say they, when it comes to regimes, I mean, most of them do, really, do not really stand for all of the values we stand for. I mean, neither Iran stands for liberal secular democracy, nor Saudi Arabia, duh. Uh, and n neither Turkey, which is actually turning more Islamist after the rise of Erdogan and, and the Islamic parties. And then you have all of the rest that I, I do not accept the United States. I do not see any, any country that really shares the values of liberal democracy and, and, and human rights. But there are people, there are individuals, who do share the values that we share. There are people like Raif Bedawi in Saudi Arabia, who, who started the liberal Saudi network, obviously got jailed by the government. And, and, and there are so many others who are in Egypt, in Iraq, where I come from, in Syria, in, in Kurdistan, uh, even in Pakistan, and, and so many other places, that they stand for the values we stand for. But they are not being able to be successful because it's unfortunately, it's now easier to start a terrorist group in the Middle East than to start a secular one. And one of the main reasons why this happens is you have the excess of evil, who are Saudi Arabia and Iran and Pakistan, who would start funding any terrorist group or any Islamist group that would stop any form of liberal secular values to spread around the region. And that's one of the main mistakes that happened in the Iraq war and the, the world that I live is that what the United States was expecting is creating a liberal democracy in, 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 around the Middle East, in, in Iraq mainly. And they were expecting like Iran and Saudi Arabia just going to go, you know what, Americans, build secular democracy here and we're not going to do anything and everything's going to be wonderful and we can uh, sing Kumbaya. But <laughs> it really didn't work out this way. And, and, and one of the main reasons why it didn't work out this way is that you have because this thing is generally ignored that you have the sectarian, you have, you have different, different, not different religions, but different sects about the religion that can be influenced by all these regional forces. So when America invaded Iraq, you have Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni. The moment he, he left power, the, the, the Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and others start funding the Sunni militias because they were afraid that the Shias, who, are, who are, are also funded by Iran, would take over and therefore kill the Sunnis. So you have all this civil war since, and, I, and that's the reason I became an activist, you have all this civil war started immediately by the moment that they took Saddam out of power because Saddam was holding everything together because when it comes to Saddam, I mean, calling him a bad guy is probably a compliment. Um, is that anybody who disagrees with him used to get killed, and that's why he was able to keep all the country together. And the moment you, another thing about dictatorships, because dictatorships control almost everything. So when you take a dictatorship away, there's a huge vacuum is going to be created. You don't have civil society, you don't have think tanks, you don't have institutions, but when it comes to dictatorship, everything is tied to this institution. So when you take out this institution, you get the civil war, and you, and you get these three, two major powers, Iran and Saudi Arabia, try which, uh, to influence what I call the middle countries. So the middle countries, I don't know if I'm getting so confusing here, but the middle countries are the ones that exist between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that's mainly, and tend to be multi-sects, multi like 
Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. So you got all these middle countries, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, in which most of the civil war happened, because you got Iran and Saudi, Iran and Saudi Arabia funding all the, uh, all, the, all the sectarian forces over there. So what really can we do? So we created a system, and I've been, uh, I've been working on this for about a year. We created a system in which we crowdsource human rights. So we created something like Match.com for human rights. But it's kind of different than Match.com, is that it's not as uh, appealing. Um, is that you, you got activists who, who care about the values that, that we care about, human rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, individual rights, and so on, who ask for help, not necessarily financial, but they want, I'm a women's rights activist in Afghanistan looking for somebody to write an article about me, or writing for an editor, looking for a graphic designer, etc. And then people in the free world who, like ourselves, in the United States or Canada or Sweden or you name it, can offer skills to match what these guys are requesting. So you go to the website, you see like tons of requests, and that's my full-time job, is to actually recruit people from both sides and try to match them together. Because if you're going to look at all, as I said, if you look at, it's easier to start a terrorist group. So imagine what is the giants that these guys are facing. I mean, I, I was one of these people. When I, when I was in Iraq, you tried to write about Al-Qaeda against the Mahdi army and stuff like this. And you are faced, so you are just, and I was like 16, 17 years old, and then I'm facing giants of millions of funding from Saudi Arabia and Iran. What can I do? And, and, and the, only, the only thing that the seculars have in, in the Middle East right now is that they cannot really rely on regional forces to help them, because the regional forces, all tr the, especially when it comes to regimes, they all try to stop them from being successful. So that's why the West and the free world needs to, needs to stand up and help those liberals who, who are living in the Muslim world. What I do find a pr problematic here, like since I came here to the United States, which I kind of find it a bit a very unfortunate, is that what I call the, the liberal compliance with Islamism, and that's something I really want to touch on, is that the, the liberals in the West, unfortunately, have many of the times became an, a, more apologists to Islamic extremism than Muslims themselves. And so, I mean, there's no better example than the Sam Harris Ben Affleck debate that happened on Bulmar, in which the moment, uh, and, uh, if you, in case if you don't know Sam Harris a bit, he wrote multiple articles in which he criticized Islam and Islamism and, and, and the connection between Islamic extremism and terrorism. And the first thing Ben Affleck thought of, which is even though I don't think he thinks, um, <laughs> is that he called him racist. The moment that this discussion is being opened, the moment that the discussion about Islamic reformation or, or Islamic modernization or, or liberalization that can happen in the Middle East, the, I would say that the most people who stand against that are the liberals in the West. You, you'll see, like, uh, and, I, and I go around, I mean, this is probably my 100, 150 speech around the country, and I would say that the, uh, speaking sometimes in a liberal place is like speaking in a mosque. Is that the, the level of dogmatism that exists within the liberal, liberal, liberal America against, against any form of reformation in the Muslim world is kind of troubling. And, you would, you would, and I call it the unholy alliance. Is that how is that even possible? Like, you see... Americans, American liberals, stand up against the Republican Party. Oh, these guys against gay marriage, against women's rights, etc. And then, well, Islam is the religion of peace. <laughs> this is like the t top of the hypocrisy when it comes to, like, you see them going crazy about the Christian right. And, uh, they, and, I, and I had a debate about this. And I told him, what do you call, uh, and he was like a, he was a, a, a gay person, I told him, what do you call Republicans who are against gay marriage? And he said, well, they're bigots. Then I told him, thank you for calling 99% Muslims bigots, because the majority of Muslims are against gay marriage. And then he said, no, no, I didn't say that. Then I told him, if you do apply different, val different standards to white Republicans than to brown Muslims, then you, unfortunately you are a racist, because that's what racism is. So, so, so after, after the Ben, ben Affleck debate, uh, well, I would call it a debate, it was, was most like, like a shouting match, um, 
So I wrote an article on Free Inquiry magazine, and I wrote it like, who's, who's really gross and racist? Because he, that's the term he, he used to describe Sam Harris. Is, uh, well, I really think who's really gross and racist is actually both parties. You have the, you have the far right who are pretty open about it. They, they will say we're anti-immigrants, all Muslims are terrorists, uh, let's, like people like Pamela Geller and uh, the rest of these folks who, who pretty much have different agendas than I would say liberalization of the Middle East. They don't really care about, as long as somebody is not an enemy of Israel, they're probably allied with them. That's why like, they like Sisi so much. Um, and you have the far left. So this, these guys are very open about the racism. They're like, we hate immigrants, we hate all of this. It's like Donald Trump, a uh, famous quote. He said like, oh, I think that Mexicans are what, uh, rapists and and monsters, but I assume some of them are good. <laughs> uh, so so th we, they kind of follow like similar trend there. And then you have the far left who, are, who, who apply a kind of different form of racism. Is that um, I, I support free speech, but um, if, if, if a brown person or a Muslim goes and kill some cartoonist, I understand where that come from. So th that is kind of the liberal mantra, is the postmodernist cultural relativist bullshit, is that uh, I understand, and, and, and it has like, it's a di different form of racism that's not really very straightforward. It, it, it's like, oh, it's their culture. Um, female gender mutilation, oh, sometimes it's their culture. Who am I to judge? I actually get questions like this before. Is that who am I to judge that female gender mutilation is wrong? And then, she, she, she said that, oh, America is like imperialist country and we don't have any right to judge people. At all, I'm like, at all, like, female generation is wrong regardless whether it's, it's America intervened or not. It's morally wrong. And this kind of, of, of uh, giving a free pass to, to, and to, to bad behavior done by other cultures is unacceptable, in my opinion, is that cultures, and that's, probably my, my mantra, is that cultures and ideas and beliefs should be open to debate and criticism. But humans have rights. And human rights, we should all stand up for human rights regardless of the cultural belief system. And I, I think that's where the, the liberal, uh, I think Majid Nawaz uh, phrased this term, he called the liberal betrayal. Is that the liberals of the Middle East, uh, sorry, the liberals in the West have now I would say generally, but obviously there are some voices, especially here in the atheist movement, who probably understand the link between religion and bad behavior. Um, but I would say liberals, like in terms of organizational liberals and mostly in the Democrats, etc., is that they, they, they are betrayed, the liberals of the Middle East and the Muslim world, by siding with the Muslim rights against the secular. And they're the ones who always try to give excuses by calling anybody who criticizes Islam a racist, by calling anybody who's trying to reform uh, Islam racist. And I'm one of, one of these people who actually, like, you would never thought that there are two people who attack me, are people like Al-Qaeda and people, li and liberals. Who would have thought that these two people would, like, join together in one, in one team, in, in, uh, in which you see they call me, like, Uncle Tom and a self-loathing, uh, Arab and, and and all of these folks come actually are liberals. You would thought it is it is it's all Muslims, but unfortunately, that's what's happening. And we need to get these liberals back to side up with the liberals in the Middle East because I think that, as I said, the the if you're not interested in the Middle East, the Middle East is interested in you. May size and reason bless you. May size and reason bless the United States of America. Thank you. I mostly leave time for a Q&A because I think it's much more complicated than I just give a speech. <laughs> you can shout. <laughs> just kidding. What was the name of the site? That you said? Movements, movements.org. Hello. So, if closer, if we were to imagine no religion, 
would all of this probably still be there? Ouch. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yes and no. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually, it's a very important question. Well, I mean, these, these conflicts are, so like for example, the creation of ISIS. I call it the toxic mix, is that you have the theological interpretations of what they're doing, and you also have regional geopolitical reasons of what, what, why they existed. You have the discrimination by the Iraqi government against the Sunnis. You have um, so much oil in the region with so many bad ideas. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I would say that also, what would replace religion is also another question. I mean, if you, if you look at the Soviet Union, they also took over, like, they took religion away, but they also replaced it in another religion, which is communism. Um, so, I would say that religion is playing a very, I'm one of the people who don't deny that there is a problem with religion. So, I'm not Reza Aslan and, uh, and all of these uh, apologists. Um, so I, I do think that religion is playing a major role, but, and there are two routes uh, to, to solve this problem, is that, because the status quo, in my opinion, is, un, is, is unsustainable, is that you either reform religion and make it compatible with the human rights, and that's what happened to some extent with the Christian world and the Jewish world, is that uh, you don't see Christians anymore beheading people in the street for being gay, and you don't see popular support for that. Is that, yes, you, you may have some evangelical Christian saying batshit insane stuff, but he's not going to advocate for beheadings of gays and atheists and all of this stuff. And we have to, we have to, stop, we have to stop being creating uh, moral equivalencies between the Christian world and the Muslim world. I, I think that that's one of the main failures of liberalism, is that when I tell them, oh, there are suicide bombers in Iraq, and they say, oh, we have the same thing here. No, you don't. You don't have the same thing here. I mean, and not, not any sense denying that there are problems that happen in the United States. I'm not saying that there's no racism, I'm not saying that there's no problems with, with the interference of Christian right and the Republican Party, but don't, make the, don't, don't try to create moral equivalencies. So, back to the, so what, what I think is needed is, is an enlightenment in that region, in which civil society institutions are there, the, the education system is a reform that does not advocate for religious tyranny. And it doesn't, we don't have to really take out religion. I mean, sometimes if, if religion gets reformed, you can, have, you can still have civil society institutions. And I, that's really what I care about. I mean, it would be wonderful if religion is gone, but um, I don't really think it is like, I, don't, I think that reforming religion is much more pragmatic at the moment than getting rid of it, especially considering that in the region, it's where, where religion was born. Like we're talking about this region is where Christianity, Islam, and Judaism were born. So there's also nationalistic impulses there that, like for example, be, like as an Arab myself, is that when I, even though I've always been secular, so I'm not really an ex-Muslim or anything, but, um, when they see like somebody who's an atheist and an Arab, they say, oh, you lost your Arab, Arabic values. But because to them, sometimes the culture and, and religion are so attached to each other. So if you sometimes leave the religion, you're attacked as leaving the culture too, because they're all built up together. So, all right, let's go on next question. So enlightenment is the solution other than just getting rid of religion. All right, here, here we got uh, David. David. So, hey, yeah. Um, can you say uh, can you say a little bit more about the different secular groups that are working to secularize Islamic countries, and also which countries do you feel the most hopeful for that that could possibly work, if any? So, so name of secular groups in the Middle East. Yeah. No. Uh, in, and and in the West as well, but ones that are focusing on on um, secularization of Islamic society. Yeah. Well, I mean. If you, if you go to the website of movements.org, in which I recruited some of these folks, um, I mean, in Iraq, there is the civil, civil, uh, called civil democratic party uh, led by a guy called Mithal Alusi, um, who are trying to create a liberal Iraq. Um, there is multiple websites. Like when I first started as a secular activist, and I was like looking online, there were about like a 
roughly Facebook page with a thousand followers. Now I, I look at the Facebook pages by Iraqi secularists and Iraqi liberal, it's like 200,000 and 300,000. So there are tons of, there are tons of, uh, of people. And one of also one of the main reasons is that now with the rise of Islamic extremism, when ISIS and stuff, m many people who were moderate Muslims are looking at ISIS and they're like, uh-oh, is this like real Islam? And there is like a huge doubt that is ri now rising. So look at, if you look at the website, you can see tons of resources about this. Um, what, I, what is the country I'm most helpful about? I would say, um, let me think about this very deeply. Uh, I would say Iran is the most country I'm hopeful about. And, and one of the main reasons is, the, is because Iran has a kind of a secular history and a civilization. And uh, many of the young people are fed up with the Ayatollahs telling them what they should do. And, and they have a very large young population. That is, many of, many of them are tech savvy, even with all the restrictions on free speech and, and internet and stuff. You can see a lot of Iranians, young Iranians, trying to access the internet and talk about their views. And uh, so I would say it is Iran because of the civilization they have. When, when it comes to the other countries, like, I mean, I, I'm sometimes hopeful about Saudi Arabia too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I talk to a lot of secular Saudi activists. And I would say it is the most difficult country because it's the birthplace of Islam, number one. It's also the, the, where Wahhabism, which is kind of the most extreme form of Islam, is, is, is there. So I would say Iran is the, but the Iranian regime is trying their best to destroy secularism. That's why I'm one of the main opponents of that regime. But I think that there is a huge hope over there. All right. The next question. Um, I guess I'm related. Uh, my question was, how do you think the current changes in the West policy towards Iran is going to influence the region with the lifting of a lot of the trade restrictions and embargoes? Oh, you mean the nuclear deal? The yeah. Ouch. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, mean uh, the, I think the Thomas Friedman uh, mentioned that the Iran deal is like the, is the least worst thing to ever happen. Um, it, it's... I mean, there, there are lots, lots of theories and like, I would say hypothesis more than a theory about like wh how much the Iran deal is going to create an impact. Um, I, am, I am kind of now in the, in, in doing the research, so I'm just going to give you what, what my thought process is, is that so the Iranian regime, with all the sanctions and everything, was still able to fund all the terrorist groups like around the region. Now with so much now, while well, the sanctions are being lifted, they're going to get so much money. Um, I'm afraid that they're going to start to expand more than um, less. And what, and what you have, so Iran is, a, is, is, the, is the major Shia country in the Middle East. Then you have Saudi Arabia and Qatar and, and all the, the rest of the Gulf region are already so pissed off about Iran. So what I'm also afraid of is that when they see Iranian expansion, they, they're going to start funding terrorist, terrorist groups also, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all of the, all of the rest. So, I, 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 mean, I mean, because the nuclear deal was not really about human rights and liberalization or anything. I mean, it was about Iran having a nukes or not, not having a nukes. Whether it's going to be successful or not, I'm going to leave it up to the, to the future. Um, but I don't think it is the nuclear deal has any intention of like changing the region more into a liberal secular democracy. Uh, I'm afraid that the Iranian regime is going to get stronger by it. And uh, when it comes to the regional wars, I think it's, it's, it's probably it's, they're going to expand, not reduce. All right. Next question. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, my, what I'm curious about is uh, what would you say would be the most effective method of taking away power from the, you know, the theocratic elements of the Middle East. In other words, there's uh, the religious in, uh, instruction, the, the force that it has in society, is there a most effective way to lessen its strength by either you know, pointing out its uh, foundational errors uh, or maybe uh, publicizing the human rights violation elements? What, what do you think is the most effective way to bring it down a notch? Yeah, I mean, that is the million dollar question. Um, 
I, I, I think that, that the change must come from within. Um, and if you look at all this, uh, I, I mean, I, I, as far as if people are familiar you know, with my writings, I used to be a very strong supporter of the Iraq War. And I've kind of changed my mind about the subject. Is if you look at the, these theocratic regimes or even terrorist groups like ISIS, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, etc., they are they are AIDS, not HIV. So they are the symptom, not the disease. And the disease is the is the is the ideology that feeds these terrorist groups and and uh, theocratic regimes. And what we need to focus on is actually fighting the 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 ideology that these guys appeal to. And the best way to do that is to support people who are doing this work already from the region, speak the same language, have the same cultural experience that can effectively change the, 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 okay, the ideological foundation for these, uh, uh, these regimes and these terrorist groups. So if you look at people like Raif Badawi from Saudi Arabia, look at people from Iran, there's, there's a page called Iraqi Secularists that I also like. Um, there's a page called I Believe in Science. We also get them funding um, to, like this spread critical thinking in Arabic and science, scientific thought, critical, and, and so on. These are the people we, I think is the most effective way because the, it, it, there has to be an ideological change. And the, 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 the terrorist groups and, 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 uh, and Islamic regimes Islamist regimes are still able to hold because they are appealing to the principles that the majority of people adhere to. Is that I can tell you that the majority of Muslims disagree with ISIS, but at the same time, if 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 ISIS was the feminist state, they are not going to get as much support as they were getting right now, so because they are appealing to main principles that exist within Islamic theology and exist within the culture itself. So unless we're going to change the minds and and culture. Nothing is going to change, and if we got, like that's why like the war on terror has not, been, has not been really successful because it's mostly dealing with the symptom, it's not the disease, and we have to focus more on, on the disease than the symptom. All right, uh, next question. Okay. Um, as a liberal in the West, I run into a lot of um, I've ran into quite a few, especially on Facebook, of atheists in the Middle East begging for help. How can I help them? And also, is there any kind of an organization being put together in any respect that can help atheists in the Middle East? I, I wish I, I heard the uh, question correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, is that you said like there are a lot of people in the Middle East reaching out to you yes, for help? Yes, I'm running into atheists in the Middle East that are crying for help, and I don't know how to help them other than just to be a friend pretty much, and is there any organized movement to try to help atheists in the Middle East? Well, the answer to the first question is send them my way. Because, uh, I, I mean, help is kind of a vague term. It really depends what type of help they're looking for. So uh, somebody needs to take the case and try to make analysis and do background checks and figure out if these people are legit and these people are not legit. Um, is there any organization that's trying to help these people? Yes, that's one organization. And there's, there's also, I mean, I would say there's Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, sometimes they try to do some help. Um, it all depends on the help itself. So I, uh, if they're looking for media coverage, sometimes like people say, I'm looking for an asylum. Getting media coverage and getting publicity for your case can actually help you sometimes getting a political asylum. So there are so many things that Many people do not understand of how people can get an asylum, etc., because they immediately think, "Oh, let's get an asylum." They think that the West is just gonna open for them a red carpet and like, "Oh, come over." Um, no, it's much more complicated than that. There is no immediate. For me, when I left Iraq, I left Iraq and then I left to Lebanon and then I lived in Malaysia for a while. It took me about three years to get my application to come to the United States. There is no way, some like, there's hardly been any way in which somebody escape Pakistan, come to Sweden. There is no. It's it's, it's pretty difficult. So, well, uh, this is my field. Uh, I mean, I would like to know more about the cases and try to uh, do more analysis. And, because, and also, I'm connect, connected to some think tanks and, uh, who do background checks and stuff on these people to know if their stories are actually legit. Because the moment you say, I'm offering help, 
you will see tons of people commenting. Like, if you look at the State Department website, that's actually one of the best jokes ever. Um, so the State Department uh, pay Facebook page is like they get multiple posts, hardly get like three, four likes. And then there's a post that says, we're offering $100,000. And then there's like tons of comments on the... Uh, so, the, so, so and, and you, you hardly know if these people are legit or not. That's why, like, while you do have limited resources and limited time, it's very important to try to figure out what are the best cases and how, how can we most effectively help them within the resources and time we have. All right. Uh, next question right here. Um, how would you say that young people, like particularly, like for me, I'm 18 going on 19 and I'm going to college soon. I don't have any college education yet. Um, how would you say that we could help with these situations? Or anyone for that matter? Yeah, uh, I mean we do have a category in, in the website in which somebody who is a student can help. Or because, if you, let me give you an example of a process of a successful story we had. Is that, so we have Raif Bedawi's wife, her name is Ansaf Haider. She sent me the article in Arabic. Okay, then there is a person who translated the article from Arabic to English. Then there is a person who edited the article. And then there is a person who was graphic designer who made it more beautiful. And then the article got published on the Daily Beast and it got hundreds of thousands of, of audience. Do you see like the step that everybody can play a role, whether it's, it's a huge, whether you're a congressman or, or a parliamentarian, because we also have congressmen and parliamentarians in our website, or it can be very small in terms of like editing or graphic design, web design, all of this probably simple compared to the policymakers, so that everybody can play a role. So you go to the website, you go add post, then offer, and then you're gonna see a form of the things that you can contribute, whether it's editing, translating. I assume your first language is English, so you're probably much more, you can speak English much better than I do. So you can help people who want help with, with tell them like this is the right way to write things and not the wrong way to write things and, and so on. So everybody I think can play a role, whether it's simple or, or big, and collectively we can get a very big result. Like imagine if, if every secularist in the Middle East or a liberal would spend an hour of their time, donating an hour of their time to help activists in the Middle East. Million secularists, that's a million hour. Imagine how, how big is the impact that's gonna happen if, if, if liberals and secularists in the West can donate one hour to change things over there. All right, next question. Can I get you to comment on the effect of the Quilliam Foundation attempting to support uh, a reform effort for Islam? Oh, that's, that's a very well-educated question. Uh, actually, I mean, I met Majid Nawaz about a month ago um, in New York, and uh, I think that they're doing Wonderful job. I mean, they're, they're also, they helped with this. If, if, I, I really recommend watching the David Cameron speech recently on fighting extremism in the UK, um, which is about admitting the problems that exist within the Muslim community and so on. And uh, I think that they are, uh, so there is, I think there are two, I, I categorize Muslims are like the ones who are active about, in two subjects. They're either, either an apologist or a reformer. So the, the difference between an apologist and reformer is that the reformer like Majid Nawaz and Asrar Nomani and, and Irshad Manji as well, that they admit that there is a problem within the Muslim community. And sometimes they admit that there is a problem with verses in the Quran that they find problematic that needs to evolve and find a different interpretation for it. And there are people like Riz Aslan and um, some idiot called Kashif Chaudhry um, who don't admit that there is any problem with and they will, and they go and double down. Not only they, they double down and they always try to shift the problem into Israel and U.S. foreign policy. It's always Israel and foreign policy. Oh, it's not raining today. Oh, it's the Zionists. Uh, so, so you get this problem with apologism is that there is nothing wrong with the Muslim community. There's nothing wrong with Islam. It's all somebody else's fault. And I think that with people like Majid Nawaz and the Kulain Foundation is that they're trying to shift the discussion and create a new narrative in which people take responsibility of her, their communities and not try to shift it to others. And I think he's doing great work. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Majid Nawaz. So, um, and, and, and Nasra Nomani, she's also, I, I did a debate with her. Not a, I was in a debate with her against three people in Brooklyn called the Islamophobia debate. And she was making a very good argument about 
let's stop blaming other people for our for mistakes that happen in our communities because that is something that i think is one of the biggest problems now in the muslim world is that when is the uh, denialism of the problems uh, of, the, of the main roots of the problem and unless that there is unless that they admit that there is a problem there no, no progress is going to happen and i think that we need more people like majid and and who would do such work and try to shift the conversation. No, it's our responsibility. It's now for us to move things forward and stop blaming America and the Jews 24-7. And yeah, so that's, I, I think you should all look for the Kalim Foundation. They're doing great, wonderful job in terms of like de-radicalization and all of that. All right, uh, this will be the last question. Hi, Faisal. I, I think um, uh, way up here in the nosebleed seats, um, I think uh, everything, El Sisi, um, uh, the president of Egypt, I, at some point in February or January, kind of called on all of the imams throughout, you know, uh, the, uh, the Ummah to, you know, kind of denounce some of this and to, to change the perception of Islam. Have you seen in the last six months, has that worked at all? Is, is anyone listening to Sisi or did that fall on deaf ears? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely people who listen to Sisi, and that's probably Sisi himself. Um, the, the, the issue with, with, uh, with Sisi, and uh, I, I would admit it, hopefully I'm not going to get killed tomorrow, is, is that I think that they, they all resemble what is now like the polarization that happened in the Middle East, is that you either have Islamists on one side or military dictatorship on the other. And he's not being a solution by jailing all liberal and secular activists in, the, in Egypt. So he, he calls for reformation and, and things of that sort. But when, when, when it comes to anybody who rejects his rule or try to be critical of his rule, they jail them. So unless you try to build liberal, liberal institutions and try to create liberal values in the country in which freedom of speech is allowed and all of that, you're still, because when, when you jail anybody who's critical of you, and that's what's happening in Saudi Arabia and in so many parts, is that you only allow the extreme of the extreme to be the dissidents. You know, so like when you jail anybody who disagree with you, you're going to have only the people who are not afraid at all of being jailed and, and not afraid of, at all of being killed. And that's ISIS and that's Al Qaeda because they've, heaven is for them the best thing ever. So. When, when you don't build a liberal, liberal society and don't build this institution, you're, you're not being part of the solution. You're actually being part of the problem. So like you, dictatorships is definitely not the solution to end Islamic extremism. There needs to be build up a foundation of liberal institutions that can maintain these values even if the dictatorship is gone. Just like what happened with Turkey. Atatur Ataturk was gone. And then now you see like them going toward the direction of Islamism because their institutions, they didn't build enough institutions that can maintain liberal and secular values over time, even when the dictatorship is gone. So we need to remove that. All right. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I need my hummus. Okay, great. Let me